for questions and answers after the formal presentation. So um, thank you very much. Well, we are thrilled to have pesticide-free New Canaan here today. It's a new group, and of course, they're really a grassroots organization that's trying to educate people uh, about pesticide use for uh, lawn control and pest control, and it's and it's something um, that's really important for us to know about. Sorry, I have to. So, oh, the quick presentation. Yeah, there we go. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Mickey Porta and and Heather. Laver, who will make the presentation and give us some good information for us to base our questions on. So please join me in welcoming them. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you to the New Canaan Library for hosting us today. And thank you for coming out in the dead of winter to talk about lawns and gardens. It sort of seems like a funny time, but we appreciate your being here. Um, before we get underway, I just want to tell you um, a little bit about the background of our core members. Um, Heather Lover is co-founder of Pesticide Free New Canaan. Um, Heather has a master's degree in public health from Yale and also extensive experience um, working in public health and environmental philanthropy, both at the corporate and nonprofit levels. Um, Michelle Ernst, who's back there with a the camera, uh, is with us today. Michelle also has a master's from Yale in environmental policy and a background in policy work and also advocacy. My husband, who's not here today, Victor Alvarez, um, has an MBA from Columbia and he helps us with our structure, our website, and generally um, carrying very heavy things from the car to any table we're manning at any fair. And my name is Mickey Porta. I'm also a co-founder. Um, my background is actually in English and art history. I was an editor and writer for many years and the principal of an editorial services company. Um, but I think it's safe to say that all four of us consider ourselves uh, grassroots environmental activists. But is that really the reason why we started this? Not really. Um, we are parents first and everything else second. Um, and we are concerned parents. We are parents who were driving around, walking around New Canaan, watching this proliferation of little yellow pesticide flags uh, that depict a parent holding the hand of a child accompanied by a dog. So this actually describes about 90% of the people we know uh, in New Canaan. And we started digging a little bit um, about what these, these little flags mean and we're alarmed to discover how many linkages exist between these chemicals that are used to control weeds and pests and all kinds of diseases ranging from leukemia and lymphoma to allergies um, and learning disabilities. Um, we were so alarmed that we thought it can't be. How can it possibly be that if these things are so bad for us, you can go to Weed and Durier, you can go to Home Depot, you can go anywhere, you know, get on the phone and call a, a landscaper, and, and these chemicals just arrive at your door. Um, the government must be protecting us somehow. And what we learned was that they're not. There is no uh, federal, state, or local body charged with protecting us from these chemicals. So at that point, uh, we felt we really needed to know more. I'm going to cut to the chase and sort of begin with the end uh, and give you the top three reasons why we should not use chemicals to control um, weeds and pests on our lawns and gardens. Number one, they're bad for our health. We know this. These chemicals are carcinogens, they're neurotoxins, they're very bad for our health, but they're especially bad for children. They're also especially bad for dogs. Dogs exposed to lawn pesticides have a two to seven times increased risk of contracting bladder cancer and lymphoma. So that's number one, health. Number two, they're bad for the environment. These chemicals contaminate the water. And when I say water, I mean everything from the Long Island Sound to our wells and everything in between. They also pollute the air. These chemicals are airborne. People are concerned about ingesting it, you know, children ingesting it. Actually, we inhale these and absorb these through the skin. So we're breathing this in the air. They also kill bees. 
and pollinators that are crucial to our food supply. This has been in the news a lot lately. Uh, right here in New Canaan last year, the New Canaan Nature Center lost an entire hive very dramatically overnight, and when they investigated, uh, the cause was determined to be pesticide poisoning. Uh, the third reason not to use these chemicals is because they don't solve weed and pest problems, and they don't grow grass. We're going to talk more about this uh, toward the end of the presentation in the how-to portion. But basically, um, what these chemicals do is they do provide a quick fix. If you spray a weed with one of these chemicals, it will temporarily kill it. But what it's not doing is addressing the underlying causes for that weed. The soil is a living thing. And if the soil's not healthy, the plants aren't going to grow well in it. And the chemicals actually hurt the soil and undermine soil microbiology so that what happens is you get on that chemical treadmill and it's very hard to get off. Um, you're going to hear me talking about pesticides. Uh, I use the word pesticide to cover herbicide, fungicide, insecticide. In many cases, too, we're talking about synthetic fertilizers. Those are not good for us or for the environment either. Side um, simply comes from the Latin to kill, and we know that pesticides are designed to kill over time and to disrupt biological sim uh, systems. We also know pesticide use is increasing in our country. We know that children are the most vulnerable uh, to the dangers of these chemicals. We're going to talk about inadequate testing and control, not just at the hands of um, manufacturers and applicators, but also the very real limits to the government's ability to um, oversee and um, protect where these chemicals are concerned. Part of the reason why I think that there's a general lack of awareness about this issue is because, let's face it, we all want beautiful lawns, we want beautiful gardens, and we want products that get us there fast. Um, we are no different from anyone else. All the members of our group, we live in New Canaan, we love it here, um, we're all property owners, and we want our lawns and gardens to look great and our property values to remain high. But we're going to talk about lawn vanity a little bit and managing expectations. Um, increasing use and potency. If you look at this slide, back in 1947, there were 25 million pounds of pesticides sold in the U.S. Forty years later, that number skyrocketed to 140 billion pounds. Um, while most of that might be due to agriculture, we do know <laughs> that um, residential pesticide use on lawns is a significant contributor to pesticide pollution in our country. Homeowners use up to 10 times more pesticide than is needed. So this is kind of like, I call this like dusting your living room with a jackhammer. Um, the U.S. Geological Survey found that there are traces uh, at least two pesticides in every stream they sampled across the United States. 100% of streams across the United States, according to the Geological Survey, um, are contaminated with pesticides. And at least one of every fish sample that they took has these chemicals in them. 600% uh, increase in nitrogen fertilizers, yet plants can only absorb a third of that. So where does that go? Um, again, synthetic pesticides. These because they're chemically derived, they're concentrated, they're more potent. Uh, again, where, where does that go? Let's talk a little bit about um, inadequate regulation. The first thing um, that I think it's important for all of us to be aware of is that the EPA does not test pesticides. There is no government agency in this country charged with testing these chemicals, okay? Um, manufacturers are not required to disclose the ingredients in pesticides. Um, studies that they conduct look only at lethal doses of a pesticide. By that, what I mean, a lethal dose is a dose that will kill you. Um, but of course, many of us in this room are not only concerned with whether the substance is going to kill us on contact or not, but whether it's going to um, cause long-term or chronic problems. And uh, we'll talk about the, the health issues um, in a little bit. Um, let's see. 
states. The states are woefully underfunded and understaffed. Right here in Connecticut, in the last few years, we've gone from 15 field agents to three. That means there is no one going around from town to town taking soil and water samples to determine what the pesticide levels are, tracking those levels, um, identifying hot spots. They simply don't have the manpower and the funding to do it. But one thing Connecticut did do, and we applaud them for it, is that in 2008 they led the nation by enacting watershed legislation banning the use of lawn chemicals for cosmetic purposes at all K through eight schools. And this includes daycare centers, um, nursery schools. Um, it's a great law and it's been in danger of being rolled back ever since because the chemical manufacturers, um, applicators, and even municipalities hate it. And we'll talk more about that later as well. Okay, inadequate testing. Um, we know that there are a lot of these chemicals out there. Pretty much there are 34 that are the most widely used. Um, of those 34, 33 are known carcinogens and neurotoxins. Um, we've talked about how the EPA does not test pesticides. They rely on the manufacturers to provide health and safety data. All the EPA does is it registers a pesticide. Um, you know, there's an ethical dilemma in that, to be sure. Um, having the manufacturer bring their own safety data and promising that, that everything's going to be okay. Um, there's also a greater problem. We touched on the fact that the manufacturers are really only concerned with lethal doses of a pesticide. Um, they're also not concerned with persistence or with combinations of chemicals. What do I mean by that? What I mean is in the real world, we're not exposed to massive quantities of pesticide all at once. We're exposed to low doses continuously over time. This is how our children get it. This is how we get it. It's how our pets get it. This does not figure at all into the testing paradigm um, of manufacturers. Um, combinations or cocktails of these chemicals you might be using three, the neighbor on the right is using four, the guy behind you is using two. Add to that the chemical presence that already exists in our lives with the flame retardants in the clothing, the carpets, the wall paint, the shampoo, the nail salon. You know, um, to be fair to manufacturers, it is very hard to test um, because it's hard to comb out what came from where. But certainly in the case of these lawn chemicals, we know that they're just no good for anything. I'm going to turn it over now to Heather who has a health background and is going to talk in greater detail about some of the health risks. Before I get into the health risks, I just want to relay a, a real quick story. Um, I've been in contact with the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. That's what we call DEEP. Um, Speaking with their pesticide monitoring person, she was the one that exclaimed, oh, you know, I really can't get out to, to Fairfield very often because I have to put in for a rental car and it might be a week or two. And this is what I'm saying. I, we have some grave concerns. Can you come out and test? She said, well, you know, last year we had 15 agents. This year we only have three. And so she'll put in for a rental car and let me know when she gets it. So that's kind of the status of our Connecticut DEEP uh, with regards to water quality monitoring. Now, they may have a few more who are monitoring things that aren't re you know, related to pesticides, but that's the status of the pesticide monitoring. Um, when I got back to her um, in January, sh we had her come out and test. She took several s seven samples. And it takes a while in the lab, but they got the, the lab to do a priority test on those water samples. Uh, and in speaking with her in January, she said, you know, the EPA has 900 professionals registering these chemicals, and we have two lab people running all the samples for our state. And this is the only lab in Connecticut that can do this sophisticated um, testing on these pesticides. So, there, you know, she's literally up against 900 people registering these things and two or three people really monitoring what comes out of that. Um, so that's why a lot of these things are on the market. You just can't, can't keep up with that. 
So uh, she said, well, the samples came back, but there's some grave concern at the EPA because they don't know what's in this stuff. So looking at these advanced chemicals, they have this great machine that does all this advanced analysis. They have no idea what all those chemicals are. So they're saying, well, it's going to take us some more time to really figure out what those chemicals actually are. And this is just seven, seven samples. So with that, I move on to health risks. <laughs> so there are no purists in this room, right? We, we are all trying to do the best we can, but we're not also not purists in the sense that everyone in this room has some pesticide sample, uh, pesticides in them. So 100% of Americans have traces of pesticides in their body tissue. It's a fact, point of fact. Um, where is it mostly? It's, it's stored in the body, body fat. So uh, it's absorbed through the skin. That's how you principally get it. But also you can inhale it. It can volatize off the lawns, uh, get brushed in dust mites. Uh, so you can inhale it, you can absorb it, you can ingest it. Um, this is something I didn't know before I did the research. Showering and bathing in that polluted water, meaning if it's got pesticides in it, exposes the body to that pesticide level six times that of drinking it, um, surely because of the, the volume in the surface area of skin. So think about that next time you put your kids in the bathtub for an hour. So what are the typical health outcomes, health outcomes that we can expect? This is basically we're talking about the U.S. population, okay? You, one can expect in the U.S. general population lower fertility, autism spectrum disorders, birth defects, organ damage, uh, mood disorders, depression, cancer, and neurological problems, anything from learning disabilities to uh, uh, elderly have a 70% increase in Parkinson's disease if they're exposed to pesticides over time. Now, children are even at greater risk. Um, it makes sense. They're smaller. They're developing. They take in more per body weight than adults. So they, they've got just more coming in at them. They're also in their developmental prime. So children under five years of age, you know, their brain development is going full force. And any kind of disruption in chemicals, in their body can have a severe effect. I mean, that's why they call it the terrible tooth. There's raging, you know, activity up there. Um, and they're less able to detoxify. So their liver, the kidneys are not fully developed. They've got all this stuff coming in at higher uh, concentrations per body weight, and they're trying to detoxify this with organs that aren't fully developed yet. They also, from an environmental standpoint, they play outdoors more. Um, and they also, as a consequence, track substances into the, the house. And a lot of these chemicals are not meant to break down in darkness, right? They, they take some light to break down into other chemicals, non-harmful. So that stuff can literally stay in your house for quite a while. It's the analogy I make is, you know, the plastic bags are meant to break down with sunlight, but if they fall into the ocean, it takes thousands of years for them to break down. It's the same concept. And children typically take baths more frequently, so again, they're exposed, and six times that of actually having a drink of water, they're, they're getting it all over their body. Um, and you would think the placenta protects the fetus, uh, but it does not. So here are some studies. This slide shows some studies, some very some specific uh, studies, because you know we've had a few people say, I don't really believe you. The 2012 American Academy of Pediatrics issues a report on the dangers of the health effects on children exposed to pesticides. It's a nice general study. And the same year, the NIH study uh, found that persistent exposure to children, even to low doses of these toxic substances, can cause serious inherited effects. So let me repeat that, inherited effects, not just impacting them, their children and their children. Okay. 1989, a National Cancer Institute finds that the children develop leukemia six times more often when exposed to pesticides. And then a 2009 Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry study found that children who live in homes where pesticides are used are twice as likely to develop brain, brain cancer. <coughs> and then lastly, this, this note is just to, to emphasize that these things get on the market before the health outcomes are really determined. A 1987 study showed that children absorbing the insect repellent DEET, you know, it's been taken off the market, but it got on the market. Uh, even if they were exposed for even three nights, they developed toxic encephalopathy. Now, do we really need to die before they take it off the market? 
um, it shouldn't be there in the first place. So this, we're going into the portion of what to do about these things. Now I want to make a, a comment on water, since water is obviously a concern and pesticides dilute in water, uh, it's everywhere. Uh, you can't always control what comes into your house, so we're realizing that. We do have some very simple pesticide kits back there. They test for the co most common, mostly agricultural chemicals, so atrazine and simazine, but that's a start. Um, you also can call your water agencies. Whoever's providing your water, the municipality should have an annual report that gives you the quality of the water. Um, but test it if you're concerned. Uh, you can start with a really cheap kit, and if you have the most common chemicals, then you know you might have other chemicals in it, and then you can go for a more expensive test. Um, if you know that you have pesticides coming in, or you just don't even want to bother with it, you want to take action, you can get an activated carbon system that filters through most of the pesticides. If you have a good one it'll, and you clean the carbon filter, it uh, will uh, filter out 80 to 90 percent of the pesticides that come into your house. Um, it won't take care of the bacteria, but then you can also get an osmosis, reverse osmosis system. So if you're really having problems, those are the routes that you go. So that's just a note on what you can do about it. These chemicals up here, um, I'm going to go through them really quickly. These are the most common ones that you need to avoid, okay? So X through this, avoid these. Alachlor and atrazine are the most commonly sprayed herbicides. You also have, quickly, diazinon, merit, dilox, calstar, acephate, orthene, trimec, balon, tupersan, any 2,4-D agent project. If you see 2,4-D, don't buy it. It's agent orange. It's just diluted. And then chlordane, which has been taken off the market. Uh, however, if you have an older home, you need to test your basement for chlordane. It stays around forever. It, it gets into groundwater. does not degrade very quickly at all. So it is still in the system if it's been sprayed around your house. So uh, test your basement. Test your water. Um, chlordane is pretty nasty. It was used for termites. Uh, it can cause uh, organ damage. And then dioxins. Dioxins are, um, can break down from a number of chemicals, but it's uh, also chlorine breakdown. Okay, and also note that GMO products, there's this big movement for non-GMO. It's, it's not necessarily just that people don't want genetically modified seeds, it's that the, the counterpart to that is that you have to use those genetically modified seeds require pesticides to grow properly. So that's how many of the chemical companies are cornering the market. You know, there's one that owns 90% of the seed stock in the United States, um, and it's genetically modified, and it requires pesticides to grow. So that's why that non-GMO movement is growing. It's, it's, uh, it's for your own health and safety. These are common. I'm not going to go through all these chemicals, but you can just kind of eyeball them and see that they're there. Uh, these are the pesticides frequently detected in the United States urban streams. So that's our streams, uh, as opposed to rural streams where they dump agricultural products. Uh, so, so example, carbaryl is an insecticide. It causes reproductive neurotoxic endocrine disruptors. That means it messes up your hormones, uh, and it causes organ damage. So we've mentioned 2,4-D, which is another herbicide. Um, again, it's, it's an irritant and all those other things. And then uh, simazine, which our test back there tests for, can cause organ damage and is also an irritant. And there's a few here that are teratogenic. That means it causes severe birth defects. So diazinon is one of those as well. So nasty stuff, but these are commonly detected in all of our streams in the United States. And that study was done in 2006. So I'm going to uh, hand it back to Mickey, who's going to go into the portion that's more of a, the what do you do with your lawn. So now that you know what you can do with your health and that it, what's happening to your health, Mickey's going to talk about some of these real practical solutions for your lawn. Okay. Yeah, this is the good news portion. This is the happy part of the presentation. Um, I'm going to give you just a real general overview um, about lawns and gardens. We're lucky today to have Paul Saltanis in green back there. Paul uh, is the proprietor of Country Green from Monroe, Connecticut. Um, he is very well versed in organic land care. He also knows a lot about chemicals. He's licensed to um, use chemicals and does um, when required to do so. So. Um, when we're done, Paul can really answer very specific questions that you might have about your own lawns and gardens. 
Um, I'm going to go back to the soil that I touched on briefly in the beginning in my top three reasons for not using lawn chemicals. Um, soil is alive. It's a living thing. And if the soil is no good, the plants aren't going to grow. Um, the chemicals harm the soil. It's as simple as that. Uh, so you need to really focus on the soil. And the first step is to take a soil test. Uh, you can get a soil test at a hardware store, these inexpensive ones. I don't recommend them because they're not great. Um, on our website, we walk you through how to take a soil sample and send it off to UConn. Um, they send it back in the form of a computer printout with all kinds of information about whether your soil is too acid, too alkaline, it needs lime, it needs a calcium-rich fertilizer. It's really a roadmap for what to do. Um, also, a professional like Paul will take a soil test. And if you're working with someone who has not taken a soil test, it's not someone you want to be working with at all. Okay. Um, next thing, follow good natural lawn care practices. What does that mean? Most of us think we know how to mow our lawns, that we know how to irrigate, we know how to clear off debris and fertilize. And um, really, we don't. Um, it's important to know how to mow the lawn. Most of us mow it too low. You need to mow high, and what that means is leaving two and a half to three inches on the grass blade when you're done mowing. Most of us mow it way down, and what that does is it actually bruises the grass. It hurts it so that it's weakened and opens the door for weeds and pests. So you mow high, and as a result, what you, you leave behind are clippings, not big clumps of of grass, but clippings. What those clippings are is free fertilizer. So leave the clippings on when you're done mowing. That will give your grass about a third of the nitrogen it needs in a year. It just is, it's dollars just being absorbed right back into the soil. Um, irrigation. Most of us also think we need to irrigate frequently, a little bit every day. Uh, wrong. What we need to do is water the lawn very deeply and infrequently. Give it a good soaking and then hang back and wait. Um, you know, Paul can talk a little bit more about that depending on the season and the temperature. But what that does is inc it encourages the roots to grow very deeply. You don't want shallow root growth, and that's what that shallow watering will do. Um, fertilizing. Once you have a soil test, you know exactly what your soil needs. No more, no less. So fertilize according to what that test tells you. Mulching in place. If you have a mulching mower, you actually can just go over the leaves and mulch them right on the lawn. Again, that's nutrient that goes right back into the soil. If you don't have a mulching mower, you can probably remove some of that leaf cover, leaving a smaller portion of it and going over that with a regular mower. Again, Paul can, can talk about that in greater detail. And aerating and overseeding. Um, you know, this sounds fancy, it's really not. Aerating is like giving your lawn a facial. What happens is you see those little plugs around, that's aeration. You just take these plugs out of the soil with a machine, you can rent it, share it with your neighbors, any professional can do it for you. And once those plugs are removed, you seed the lawn with a variety of grasses. It's very important not to seed the lawn with one kind of grass. You know, we don't want Kentucky bluegrass in Connecticut. That's a losing proposition. You want to get at least three grass varieties, preferably four. Uh, rye is a good choice. Fescues are a good choice. Grass is a very robust plant. If it's growing well in good soil, it will actually crowd out the weeds. So you get that combination, and you're actually sowing the grass crop for the next season. Uh, this is something you do about once a year. Um, using a calendar, what I've been talking about is not difficult. It's not rocket science, but it has to be done a certain way, and it has to be done at a certain time. Uh, so it's important to maybe keep a calendar so that you know where you are in the season. In the winter months, for instance, we recommend that you use calcium chloride or sand instead of salt. Um, the salt is very, very damaging to the soil, to plants, and also the runoff from the water. Uh, March and April, you're going to mulch those leaves, that debris that's still on the lawn. You're going to not blow those. Um, April and May, 
We're coming into spring. It's a good time to think about aerating, um, possibly applying compost. Compost is free in New Canaan. I don't know if you're aware of that. You can back your car up behind Waveney where the paddle courts are and you can just fill it with as much compost as you can carry. Um, again, this is a good time to test your soil and gauge where it's at, what it needs. Uh, deep thatching, we put this in here because you're going to read a lot about that in organic land care and in some of our own literature. We recommend that you not deep thatch um, unless a professional tells you to because you could be removing v valuable nitrogen. Um, you tend to only need to do it when you have a real serious pest infestation. Um, De-weeding. You can start pulling weeds at this time, early in the spring, um, hand pulling using hot water. Hot water actually kills the weeds. Uh, vinegar, regular white vinegar from the supermarket, 5% acidic. That works, but you have to be careful because it's a herbicide. It'll kill everything else, too. Um, they make all kinds of gadgets that some of the dads tend to like. There's this, like, flame thing that actually, it's like a blowtorch for weeds. And it really gets them because it just cooks everything. It kills everything, yeah. So there's the flamethrower. Um, there's little, there's gadgets that I like that look like, um, what's it called, Paul? That thing that's like a, it looks like a shovel, but it's got a pick at the end. And with a twist of the wrist, it pulls out the weed from the, there's a name for it. You can get it. Anyway, there's all kinds of gadgets to help you weed. June and July, here we go. The weeds start coming. So we wrote um, very elegantly monitor weeds, but that's not what we do, right? We curse at the weeds. We sweat over the weeds. Hand pull, spot treat, um, you know, water long and less often. Uh, planting natives. We put that in so that um, people... Um, kind of have some perspective about what grows well here. Um, keep that in mind, not just for grass, but for ornamentals, for shrubs, for trees. It's an important point. August and September, coming into fall, if you haven't done it already, this is the time to aerate and overseed. Um, it's also time to apply fertilizer as needed. And then when you wind down in October and November, you're doing your fall cleanup, your leaf removal and mulching. Um, one more compost if you do apply compost to your lawn. And this is the final mow of the season. This is the only time you're going to mow low to two inches. Okay. Um, you might have noticed that um, everything that I've been talking about is really kind of a how-to. It's a method. Chemical lawn and garden care is very product-oriented. Organic lawn and garden care is method-oriented. It's not about selling you stuff. It's about understanding how nature works and working with it. That said, there are a lot of companies that make great products so that we don't have to completely go without our spray bottles and our granules and our dusts and our powders. Um, this is just a, a, a short list. We have this information on our website as well. Paul deals um, wholesale. Um, he's a wholesale dealer of North Country Organics, which is another very good company. Um, so you, you might check these out and um, call on these when, when needed. Um, we're here to sound a call to action. We are parents, reasonable people. Um, we're just trying to educate ourselves so that we can make some very informed consumer choices. One of the reasons for this campaign is because we're always feeling very limited um, where time is concerned. We're always keeping an eye on the budget. And we realized that this was something very small that we could do that potentially has a very large impact. So there's a lot of bang for the buck if we can make a switch and become market makers. Um, there are lots of organic products. Um, businesses more and more are offering organic services, um, like Paul, who does a hybrid. He can do the chemicals, but he knows a lot about organic. There are people who just do organic, and they're NOFA certified. You can find them on our website as well. Um, I want to go back to the ban that the state of Connecticut has in place. Um, this is a, the pesticide ban prohibiting the use of, of lawn pesticides on school grounds and playing fields. This is constantly threatened. And the way that the other side tries to um, 
weaken this is by introducing something called i p m that stands for integrated pest management what that really means is that they want to write it into the bill so that it's at the discretion of the applicator so in other words the public service the public works guys driving around in the orange trucks all they have to do if i p m language were included in this bill is to take a look at two different products over here we've got white vinegar and over here we've got two four d so they've got to say mm, i'll consider the less toxic option the white vinegar but no i'm going to go for the two four d that's it without this ban there is no oversight there's no form that needs to be filled out there's nobody minding the store this ban is a good law it protects our kids and it forces the municipalities to really learn how to manage their grounds without these chemicals. If you have the ability to use those chemicals, you will do it. You're just going to do it. Um, so we ask that you support this ban. Let our representatives know. Um, Tom O'Day, we, we spoke to Tom O'Day um, up in Hartford the other day because um, he follows in the footsteps of John Hetherington. John Hetherington supported this ban. Um, and so we've called Tom and um, invited him to come and hear us speak, um, offered to give him information, and hope that he will support it as well. Um, if you are pesticide free or you want to go pesticide free, consider putting up one of these uh, ladybug signs. Michelle's holding it up in the back. You saw them when you came in. These are the face of the national campaign. So somebody in California will have one, someone in Maine will have one. Um, these go up on your mailbox post or on a fence, and they just act as a very gentle, friendly reminder. They're adorable. The kids like them. They, they look nicer than the McCain and Alarm signs anyway. Um, and it's just sort of saying, hey, this is an issue. Ask me about this. Um, here is a link to the EPA if you want to let them know how you feel about the issue. And um, there's also another way. There's something called the pesticide registry in our state. By law, um, you are entitled to know when your neighbors are having pesticides commercially applied on their property. They have to notify you within 24 hours, and they have to tell you exactly what's going down. And this is true. Paul has had to personally knock on doors, ring bells, and say, you know, hi, Mrs. Lewis. Um, on Thursday, I'm going to be applying 2,4-D and blah, 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 blah. So how much protection does this afford you? Not much, really. You can close your windows. You can choose not to walk your dog or let your children play in that area for a few days. But more than anything, you know, it's, it's, it's a way to let the state know that you care, you're interested. Um, and we encourage everyone to act locally. You know, it's one lawn at a time. It's slow, but it makes a big difference. And one of the things that we're doing, in addition to these kinds of um, you know, talks that we do. And by the way, we'll go anywhere. We'll do this in your living room. Um, we'll do it at a church. Um, we'll take our show on the road and go to other towns. Uh, but one thing we're really excited about is we're establishing a pesticide educational research fellowship at New Canaan High School. And what this will do is train juniors and seniors in um, soil and water sampling and community engagement. So to get out there and start creating some data that Connecticut Deep can actually use to track um, pesticide levels in our community and alert the community um, that this is something very small that they can do. In some cases, it's a phone call, and it makes a very, very big difference. Here are some resources you can check out. I won't go through all of them. I'll just say beyond pesticides, the first one is a gold mine of information. Um, a little ways down the middle, EWG.org, Environmental Working Group. This is a bonanza for parents. These people test and rate not just lawn and garden products, but cosmetics, food, um, clothing. It's a great website. Um, and we're last there, pesticidefreenc.org. Check out our website. We're updating it all the time. Oh, yeah. And we have a sign-in book there. If you want to be on our email list, we don't give out your, your address, and we don't bombard you with a lot of stuff. What we do is we send out periodic reminders, like, this is what you should be doing now. 
so do it, you know. Or if you want to spray for ticks, this is a good time, and here are a few people that are reputable that we know about. Because we're also concerned about greenwash, right? Everybody wants to get on that organic bandwagon and make money, but they're not all reputable. You know, so we try to, you know, kind of steer people at different times in the year. Um, that's all for me. Heather, do you want to sure. say something? So um, put down your books now. It's the quiz. <laughs> we just want to wrap up. Nobody's watching the shop. Nobody's testing. When you pick that thing off the market shelf, you can't assume it's safe. So you are the market. So move the market. If you do one thing today, call your lawn care provider and say, Am I organic or I'd like to go organic? We even have a sheet on how to talk to your lawn care provider. So yeah, because they're going to tell you, oh, that stuff is fine. It's totally safe. You don't want to work with that person. Yeah, so if you do one thing today or this week, just call them and say, how, how am I doing here? I want to be organic. Can I be 100% organic? And you absolutely can. The other thing is you can do absolutely nothing on your lawn. This is, this is to kind of sway our lawn vanity, right? If you want a, a beautiful lawn organically, this is how you do it. But you can do nothing, and it'll be just fine. Dandelions are pretty, uh, but you'll have more weeds. Uh, so do those. The, do that one thing today, and just remember that nobody else is doing this for you. This is that. This is up to us. Okay. Um, so we'd like to open it up to questions now. Um, Paul, do you want to come up here? And I'm going to repeat the question into the microphone because this is being um, taped so that we can have it. Okay, question. Wendy. Natural doesn't mean anything, not in lawn care or in food. Like when you go to the supermarket, chicken that says natural, that's, that doesn't mean anything. So it either has to be um, organic um, there's an organic materials review board, OMRI. You can see on products, OMRI, if it's OMRI certified, it's organic. But, you know, like white vinegar is natural. You know, that's not going to be OMRI certified. So do you want to um, – oh, the qu I'm sorry, I didn't repeat the qu – the question was um, – there. Mean yeah, does natural mean organic? Um, not at all. Yeah. <laughs> and um, – Unfortunately, a lot of uh, lawn care providers uh, lie to the homeowners. And uh, don't be afraid to walk up to the applicator and say, can I see the products you're putting on my lawn? Uh, one thing you want to note is uh, uh, the first number is the, um, of uh, the fertilizer bag is the amount of nitrogen. And an organic source will not have a number higher than nine first number. If it's higher than nine, it's probably, or almost certainly, a synthetic. And uh, the other uh, thing, uh, there's a new law in Connecticut that took effect. Uh, the middle number uh, has to be a zero. There's a no phosphorus law that was passed, unless your, your soil has been tested and it actually needs phosphorus. So if they're putting something on where that middle number is other than zero, uh, you want to ask, have you tested my soil? Why are you doing that? Um, so th I think those are, the, you know, the two uh, most important things. One uh, issue is that uh, if you take a synthetic or regular lawn and you take away the chemicals, it's probably going to deteriorate uh, because the chemicals have killed all the biology in the, in the soil, and now you take them away, the lawn's going to get a lot worse. And then what happens is people get discouraged. Oh, look what happened. I need, really need those chemicals. Uh, so um, that's why you need the organic materials to give something back and get the, uh, the soil working again. Yes. Yes, we work in uh, all of Fairfield County and uh, and uh, Westchester. The question is, what does the lawn look like once you've added the compost? Does it look brown? 
Uh, yes, it does, but uh, the first time it rains, uh, you wouldn't notice it. It's, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, we have a machine that'll put like a quarter inch of compost on a lawn. And it does wonderful things. The only problem in uh, New Canaan is a lot of the properties are large and it does just a massive uh, job. Um, you know, smaller yards, it, it, it's a wonderful tool. Cost. Well, th that is a problem. On a big property, uh, organic fertilizers do get costly. But uh, I think uh, you have to weigh, uh, you don't have to do anything to a lawn. Uh, you know, do you, what is the value of, uh, you can certainly have a good looking lawn at the same cost you're probably uh, spending on a syn synthetic program. It won't be as. Uh, green, it won't be as weed free, uh, but you can have a, you know, a presentable lawn. Uh, we have many uh, lawns that are on garden tours and uh, that are really pristine, but that takes a lot of, uh, a lot of effort to do. Can and it, it's more costly. Can I say something about that, about the cost? One of the things with organic lawn care is it takes time for it to kind of kick in, especially if you've been applying lots of chemicals. But because you're working with the soil, the idea is that over time, it bec you're kind of restoring an ecosystem, okay? So if you're bringing the soil back to life, the soil's gonna take care of the plant. Um, you're, you're getting off of a treadmill, the chemical treadmill just kind of escalates this way. There's nowhere to go but up. Whereas with organic over time, my understanding is it doesn't, you know, it's not so labor intensive forever because you're, you're bringing it back into its natural um, cycle. Well, the other thing is, um, uh, I guess it was Scotts or somebody uh, a long time ago invented the idea of an application. And uh, it basically takes any thinking out of the process. You do step one through step six. And some lawns only need step four, four steps if you want to save money. You know, uh, and um, the concept is you do a little of this and a little of that, and you know what? It it does work. The lawns look better. It's uh, relatively inexpensive, and so that you know became the thing to do. The problem with that is it never addresses what's really wrong with the lawn. And do you really need all that stuff? You don't. So instead of putting the budget into these steps, which just perpetuate, uh, you know, a medium, you know, a reasonable quality lawn, if you took that same budget and turned it into, okay, well, let's soil test, correct the acidity, correct what's wrong with the soil, uh, seed the lawn with appropriate grasses, and uh, then you're correcting the underlying issues, and you don't need the, all of those. Uh, Inputs. I think one of the things that we need to do is to have more structured lawns that are not just uh, The question is, is there concern about pesticides in that compost? Um, you know, that's a good question. I don't know. That compost, I think, is leaf mulch. It's all leaf mulch. It's all leaf mulch. Um, you know, I don't know. That's a good. That's a good question. Well, actually, that if you have a uh, a chemical lawn care company, I wouldn't be putting the grass clippings in your compost bin because uh, some of the uh, pesticides are persistent, and, and people mm -hmm. compost them and then put them on their garden, which is not not a smart thing to do. Uh, the question is, we talked about tick spraying, um, and there's a lot of that in town. Is there a course that we recommend? Paul can actually talk about that. But, um, yeah, we, we have people on our website who we recommend for tick spraying, and we have found, at, at least anecdotally, people tell us that the organic um, treatments have been more effective um, than the chemical. The chemical is actually derived from the, the organic, which is chrysanthemum oil and garlic. Um, but
but Paul, you do, you do tick strains, right? Yes, the, uh, well, it's, it's a little different issue when something is trying to bite you and it's carrying the disease. Um, that's where you get into real conflicts <laughs> with organic things. But uh, uh, we found that a, uh, uh, we use uh, garlic uh, juice and uh, we, we get a, an organic, uh, uh, it's an organic pesticide, but it has a natural source uh, that is actually uh, chrysanthemum, uh, squeezed from chrysanthemums. And uh, if you treat your property uh, three times a year, uh, we found uh, that uh, we're in pretty good shape. Uh, there was a uh, website, it was Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, CAES, they do a lot of research on ticks. And I've actually done some of the test spraying for them on different products and there are some new new things in the works but uh, uh, not commercially available yet. Uh, we have used plain garlic juice and it's sometimes uh, uh, it seems to be doing the job but again uh, I hate to give anybody a false sense of security but uh, you know there, there you know one tick is one too many if it if it bites you so CAES, the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, uh, probably .gov, .ct .gov. Public health expert wants to stand, stand in. I mean, the best thing you could do, yes, do the garlic and the chrysanthemum oil. It's a pyrethrin, which is the organic underlying. The synthetic one is just stronger, more toxic. Um, but the best thing is to check your kids when they go outside. I mean. Even with all the chemicals, whether synthetic or organic, you're going to have to check your kids and check your scalp. So if you do that frequently, that's going to be 90% of the effort, actually. But Lyme disease is increasing with climate change, so we will see more Lyme disease in the Northeast. Right. <laughs> right. Well, the question here is, um, he uh, he has not used ever any pesticides on the lawn, but he does use pesticides um, around the perimeter of his home to control pests, um, insects, and so forth. Um, are those bad? Yeah. yeah. Heather Heather's going to look it up. I'm sure that of course it's bad. However. That said, I'm a city girl. I used to spray for roaches. I didn't want rats in the cellar. Um, you know, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that all chemicals are bad um, because I don't think they are. And I think even the ones that we know are bad, sometimes we have to weigh those consequences and determine whether they're worth the risk. I'm with you. I mean, if I have carpenter ants or something and I try to, to deal with them with something less toxic first, um, but that doesn't solve the problem, well, I would, I would step it up. However, lawn pesticides to me aren't worth the risk. And I think that's really the thrust of this campaign is to restore some common sense. You know, let's not say we're never going to use a chemical again, but let's use them where we get real benefit. You know, to me, Really, it is, you know, to kill a few dandelions is like dusting your house with a jackhammer. However, if you have a serious, like, rodent infestation in a school next to the kitchen, you know, I'm not going to tell you to just put down baking soda. I mean, I, I can't because I'd be a hypocrite. Right. So for, for me, Thren is, uh, it's a pyrethroid, so also a pyrethrin. Uh, it seems to be have it seems to have low toxicity uh, on the skin. They actually use it for scabies in clinical situations. 
uh, it is harmful to cats and fish. So you just have to keep that in mind, okay? So it has low mammalian toxicity and it's poorly absorbed by the skin. That's all we can tell you. Any more questions? Yeah. What do we know about Coumadin? I, I believe it's used in cancer treatment. It's a blood thinner. It's a blood thinner. It's a blood thinner. And cancer treatment. So it thins the blood for yeah, capillary. Uh, well, not professionally, but from personal battling of roots, and, you know, in my own uh, home. Uh, one person told me a good trick is uh, take the mousetrap and put it in a paper bag. Right, and that way they don't have to deal with the messy carcasses as, as you catch them. Just pick up the bag, dump it in the garbage, because they do. The, you know, especially the field mice want to come in in the winter. How do you spell that? How do we feel about mice filled with Coumadin decomposing? So Coumadin being used as a rodenticide. I have no idea. I have no idea about that, but that's a new one. That's a new one. Did you have a question? And Municipalities have higher uh, standards. They do have to follow all EPA standards. Uh, the EPA does, you know, there's, they also recognize that there's going to be some level of pesticides and, and contaminants in the water. So the question is how low are they, how high are they setting the bar um, on the municipalities? But in general, municipalities' tap water is much better than even bottled water, um, quite frankly, because many of the bottled companies actually use just tap water and they maybe run it through one more filter, but that's not gonna do much more. Um, so you, you should be safe, but if you have a concern in your municipality, if you're in a high spray area, with New Canaan is one of the highest sprayed towns in Connecticut. Greenwich beats us by a few ordinances, but uh, we're one of the highest sprayed towns. We have something like 34 aquatic permits for spraying. So the municipality's water source is coming from the surrounding water reserve. So um, it all comes down to the watershed management. But you, they should, they have to put out an annual quality report. It's called a competence report. Um, so ask for the competence report, the annual competence report. But test your water. I mean, for 15 bucks, you can do just the main one. So if you know that you've got the main chemicals in your water, you know you have a problem. So I would start with that. Um, because the more uh, specific tests can run anywhere from 200 to 800 dollars, so start with a 15 if you're concerned. If you find something, then go the next step. But your your the competence report uh, has all the required report reporting in it. They may not have pesticides because they may not be required to test. They don't even know what they're supposed to be. The EPA doesn't even know what they're testing for. They came out and said we don't know what these chemicals are. So they may test for atrazine, um, the main herbicides, aliquor, atrazine, simazine, um, but they may not test for the other some 500 chemicals that are on the market. Um, Aquarian will still f will not give you more testing than the EPA requires because they don't want to be liable. They're only going to do what they're required to do. Um, so if you're really concerned and you find some chemicals in there or you're just concerned, spend the $500. But it will take a time because that's the one lab in Connecticut yeah. that can do all the samples. Okay, maybe one more question. And um. Can you tell us how much Coumadin you can watch out for? Is that the only one? There, uh, uh, the, the question is uh, c we can't. Uh, can you tell us some of the companies to watch out for? Um, we can't. Um, 
because they have very deep pockets, you know, so we, we can't get in, involved in that. What we can do is tell you who you should hire or talk to, and we have names of those people on our websites and little descriptions of, of who they are and what they do. Um, you know, Paul here, um, Country Green, is, is one of the good guys. Um, but we can't. We, we have to be very careful even in our presentations not to use brand names, which is why Heather created that schedule y or that chart that has the chemical name. Nobody really knows the chemical name. You know the brand. You go to the hardware store and it's blah or blah or, you know, we can't say the, the name. But that said, you know, they're moving more toward organics. So the, the point is if you don't ask, they're never going to create a market around that because you're not demanding it. So demand it. And if they can't give it to you, just say, sorry, I can't stay with you. Okay. Well, we wholesale <coughs> organic products. So if you have a landscaper you're happy with uh, that's been, you know, supplying things to, to your lawn, say, hey, you know, I want you to use organic materials. And you can send them to me, get them started, and I'll, you know, uh, help <coughs> them, uh, you know, switch to organic materials. And the other thing is I really suggest you uh, walk up to the applicators and ask them what they're doing. And uh, if they can't answer you, it, it, you shouldn't be dealing with them. And yeah, look, at, look at their truck and say, hey, can I see the bag? And what's in that? And what's in that sprayer? <laughs> okay, one more in the back. Yes, he's, the, the yeah, comment is that yeah, applicators need to be licensed. To look for, the, the truck should have a D number on, on it, the D dash something or other, and uh, to identify that they are uh, licensed by the state. Okay, this is really the last. Okay, the question is, is, is there a movement to reduce the size of lawns um, so that we can, we can minimize the use of chemicals? Yes, there is a movement to do that. I mean, I think personally we would love to see the perfect lawn become a lawn where there's a greater tolerance for weeds. Um, when I go up to a pristine emerald green lawn, I just freak out. I don't want my kids near it. I don't want to walk near it. I won't drink people's well water in New Canaan when their lawn looks super nice. Um, minimizing the size of your lawn is certainly one strategy. Um, it is, there is a national movement to do that. Um, you know, it can be nice if you're a gardener. It's actually much more fun. Lawn is really boring, so you want to have other things going on. Um, but we don't really, I, I guess we, maybe we should talk about that more in our um, how-to section, that that could be a strategy because you could have, w there is one person actually, we, on our website we have something called the Hall of Fame, which is pesticide-free lawns that you can actually go see, lawns and gardens. People, gardeners love to talk forever about their lawns and gardens, so you can actually make an appointment and go see these places. Heather, um, Heather and Michelle are both quite accomplished organic gardeners, and we'll talk to you for days about their vegetables and their blueberry cages and their lawns and stuff. Bye, Michelle. Yeah, you're zucchini. Um, one woman, what she did was the front lawn is absolutely perfect. It's an organic demonstration lawn site. And then she's got this fence which opens to this breathtaking rolling property that goes down to a reservoir and has a lap pool and everything. But that lawn is a little more freewheeling. So she kind of, you know, the, the lawn I'm talking about, Francis Edwards, um, it's, it's um, you know, she's got one for presentation and one that's just for hanging out, you know, for the family only. It's a good strategy. There is a, an ecological landscape association that is a lot more into planting with natives and meadows and all of that sort of thing. Uh, they're more Boston-based, but they do have a show coming up, and if you're a gardener, um, you might want to go to that. Um, they're much more into alternatives to uh, lawns and uh, things. 
Well, thank you so much. Thanks for, and we'll, we'll be here if you have a few more questions or comments. We'll just be taking down our thing. But thank you so much again for coming out today to, uh, to hear us speak. Thank you.